Distinguished representatives, good afternoon. I'm advised that we have at least 24 member states uh, around the table. If you could take your seats, please. Thank you. Esteemed colleagues, we will now proceed to the next item on the agenda, which is the presentation by the candidate for the position of Assistant Secretary General of the Organization of American States. Ambassador Nestor Mendez is a career diplomat. He holds a master's degree in international policy and practice from George Washington University, a graduate level certificate in diplomatic studies from Oxford University, and a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Belize. Ambassador Mendez served as Ambassador of Belize to the United States of America, permanent representative to the OAS, and then resident High Commissioner to Canada. He previously held diplomatic posts at the High Commission for Belize in London, 1997 to 1999, and at the Embassy of Belize in Guatemala. Ambassador Mendez was elected as the ninth Assistant Secretary General of the OAS in 2015. Ambassador Mendez, thank you for being with us today to share your vision for the OAS and the initiatives that you would undertake should you be re-elected as the Assistant Secretary General. You may take the floor from the podium for 50. Oh, would you prefer to, to, to sit and speak? No, 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 it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah. Please. Ambassador Mendez, I'm honored to offer you the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, whoever says that there are no special privileges for people with temporary uh, challenges for movement, um, that's not true at the OS. Thank you for allowing me to, to speak from here. Distinguished ambassadors, permanent and alternate representatives, personnel of the General Secretariat, ladies and gentlemen. It certainly is amazing how time flies. It feels like it was just a couple of months ago that I was standing before you, but it was 2015. Uh, when I made my original presentation to the Permanent Council. And today one of my colleagues was asking me, so what is different this time? And I said, you know, all you have to do is take a look at a photograph. Back then, I had hair and it was black. And some people have even suggested that I was probably even a little taller, but I am not sure. Five years ago, I appeared before this Permanent Council to share my thoughts and vision about the role of the Assistant Secretary General, and I ask for the opportunity to assume such a role. Today I wish to begin by thanking you for the invaluable support that you have extended to me and my office during this period. It has certainly been for me an incredible voyage of learning, of team building, and of delivering under conditions that you only get to know and understand once you are inside the organization. I have had the privilege of working at the political level on all four pillars of our institution and with a focus on critically important issues such as youth empowerment, innovation and competitiveness, climate change and building resiliency against natural disasters, including improving the capacity of the member states to respond to natural disasters. We also focused on the multidimensional pillar from the perspective of prevention such as working with at-risk youth before they fall into gangs and generation of opportunities for them, among other things. I have worked to bring visibility to important cross-cutting issues, such as those related to Afro-descendants and indigenous peoples. In addition to several specific initiatives to strengthen the Permanent Council, such as the institution of orientation seminars for new permanent representatives, and ongoing efforts to modernize the systems that support the work of the Permanent Council. We have endeavored to strengthen the coordination with other multilateral institutions in the inter-American system and with our affiliated agencies, such as the Young America's Business Trust and the Pan American Development Foundation. Under my leadership, my office has improved the management of the national offices networked and has worked to minimize the impact on these offices of the ever-shrinking financial resources allocated to them. Clearly, there is a lot more work to be undertaken 
and I am better positioned than ever to get it done. I come before you now not only as a former ambassador to the OS, but also armed with the experience of the last five years and equipped with a clear understanding and an integral perspective of what needs to be done to rectify some of the deficiencies of our institution, to fortify the areas that demand priority attention, and to continue shaping the OS into what is required so as to respond to the ever-changing needs of our member states. Today, I am much better positioned to continue managing and delivering on the incredible responsibility with which the Permanent Council honored me over the last five years. Señoras y señores, ahora quisiera referirme a esos temas sobre los que propongo seguir trabajando y los nuevos que propongo abordar. Como recordarán, las funciones del Secretario General Adjunto están definidas en el artículo 115 de la Carta de la Organización, el cual especifica que esta persona es el Secretario del Consejo Permanente y asesor del Secretario General. Con el compromiso serio con el cual siempre he desempeñado estas funciones, propongo ahora enfocarme en los siguientes temas teniendo siempre presente que la cabeza política de esta organización es el Secretario General. Addressing some of the general issues. Under my leadership, my office will take a more proactive and assertive role in proposing and implementing certain direct initiatives in response to needs and priorities signaled by member states. For instance, in response to the statements by some Caribbean leaders pertaining to the need for the Caribbean to become bilingual as a priority requirement for competitiveness and calling directly for the OS to step in and fill this niche, my office is finalizing a proposal to address this request in a very practical way with an initiative called Idiomas Como Puentes. Our plan calls for this initiative to be anchored on a teacher exchange program at the kindergarten level, and we already have clear expressions of interest for participation from several Caribbean leaders, as well as from Ecuador and from Spain. In order to implement said program, we will work with the requisite experts from within the General Secretariat working with the Permanent Council. As Secretary of the Permanent Council, I work closely with the Chair of the Permanent Council and all the missions. From this vantage point, I am not oblivious to the climate of tension and sometimes divisiveness that stems from the difficult issues that confront the membership. We all work in a multilateral setting that can be complex, conflictive, and slow to shift direction. And so we must be innovative and practical in identifying and organizing opportunities for the representatives of the member states to engage in dialogue beyond the choreographed setting of the Permanent Council. We need to decompress this, the environment in this critical political body. In keeping with the recommendations of the Working Group on Institutional Strengthening, I will promote and organize more opportunities for formal and informal dialogue between the member representatives and the General Secretariat. Delegations will remember that over the last few years, we have had such events in my office during the fall. I will also work with the Permanent Council to retool the General Committee into a point of convergence and coordination of the work of the committees. These initiatives will be undertaken bearing in mind the management modernization exercise of some time ago and the recommendations contained therein. With a view to generating a new and more positive dynamic between the General Secretariat and the Permanent Council, and in order to foster collective ownership in our institution, we will be presenting for the use of the Permanent Council a new information product that we expect will enable the Permanent Council and the General Secretariat to work hand in hand to project a more holistic and positive view of our institution. What does this mean? This means that shortly, we will put in place a system where every month we will be delivering to each one of the missions a document that contains all the activities that the OS is doing at that particular moment in any one of our countries. How will this be useful? Every representation, every mission will have the opportunity to know exactly what the OS is doing in their countries, perhaps a sign of value to what it is that we're delivering at that particular moment in time. But beyond that, in their interface with the external public, 
the ambassadors, the representatives who can speak in a very up-to-date, in a very informed manner of what the OS is doing in their countries is good for the representatives and it's good for us as an institution. Also for the Permanent Council, we have embarked on and will continue with an initiative to update and modernize the archives and records keeping system of the Permanent Council and the General Assembly by initiating a new user-friendly video library archive system using state-of-the-art technology. This system will also provide automated written verbatim reports of the Council meetings and we are expecting to roll out this service in the near future. Señoras y señores, quisiera referirme ahora al tema de las finanzas de nuestra organización. Tengo muy presente la situación financiera de la OEA, su presupuesto cada vez más pequeño y el impacto directo sobre el número y nivel de personal que podemos mantener. En ese sentido, Reconozco que el ambiente político quizá no es óptimo para iniciar una discusión sobre un incremento de presupuesto o al menos una redistribución de las cuotas. Esta situación pone en relieve la urgente necesidad de identificar y tener acceso a fuentes no tradicionales de recursos, tales como los principales fondos internacionales. Y yo utilizaré la capacidad política de mi cargo para ayudar en los esfuerzos de movilización de recursos, trabajando, por supuesto, muy de cerca con el personal que tiene la responsabilidad de gestionar estos recursos dentro de la Secretaría General. Some essential elements that need to be put in place for these efforts to succeed include, for example, ensuring that we have the technical financial reporting capacity and a rationalized industry accepted indirect cost recovery rate and policy. Turning to national offices, I am worried about the chronic shrinking financial base for this network, a unique asset of our institution which needs to be optimized. Delegations will remember that some time ago, at their request, my office prepared a comprehensive strategy for our national offices and this document is still being considered by the delegations. I'm also worried that we have many of these offices without a titular national representative in place. In order to address this issue, last year we issued a call, an invitation to OAS staff based at headquarters who may have an interest in being posted to these national offices and who fit the profile for such deployment to indicate their interest. The response has been quite positive. In order to implement the management of this, to improve the management of these offices, we have also prepared and distributed a detailed administration manual. This is a new tool which we're trying our best to keep updated as the institutional procedures change, and it will be of tremendous assistance to our new representatives as they assume their important responsibilities. Maximizing the potential of the inter-American ecosystem. Much has been said about the importance of securing a better engagement and, if possible, a basic coordination with the other institutions in the Inter-American Network and with the sub-regional organizations operating in our jurisdiction. Recognizing the tremendous potential of the OS, situated as it is in the center of this ecosystem, I initiated a series of meetings with a number of these institutions to enhance cooperation to find synergies and complementarity in our work, as well as to avoid duplication. We identified five areas for collaboration. These are social inclusion, implementation of the sustainable development goals, empowerment of vulnerable populations, generation of economic opportunities and education. We agreed with these organizations to begin our work focusing on two areas, social inclusion and the implementation of the SDGs. We intend to resume these exchanges later this year. Además de las instituciones antes ya mencionadas, la OEA también es la base de varias de nuestras agencias afiliadas, tales como la Young America's Business Trust, la Fundación Panamericana de Desarrollo y la Trust for the Americas. Durante los últimos años, Yo he trabajado muy de cerca con estas organizaciones y les he brindado apoyo constante, especialmente en temas que tienen que ver con la juventud, competitividad, la innovación 
y la generación de oportunidades económicas para jóvenes en riesgo, con especial atención a mujeres jóvenes. Reconozco que existe un gran potencial y grandes oportunidades para trabajar estrechamente con estas organizaciones y así lo seguiremos haciendo. Ladies and gentlemen, the permanent observers constitute an important strategic partner of our, in our institution and we need to keep nurturing the potential of this relationship. In order to do this, my office will propitiate additional new opportunities for engagement beyond the usual opportunity of the General Assembly. In fact, we already had one such engagement and it was quite positive. Un tema que tenemos que tratar eh, con mucha seriedad es el tema de cómo nos presentamos hacia nuestro público exterior. Y mi, mi oficina propone, y yo propongo que trabajar, trabajaremos más de cerca con el departamento de prensa para asegurar de que nuestros países, nuestros públicos tengan un panorama más amplio de la complejidad y la diversidad de los proyectos, programas y e iniciativas que tenemos en sus países. As we look to the future, under my leadership, my office will continue its pioneering work in those areas in which we have been engaged and to which we have brought structure and political attention. I will continue the work we initiated to make the important issues of Afro-descendants and indigenous peoples truly cross-sectional, and with a view to start implementing the respective plans of action in a pragmatic and consistent manner. I will continue paying special attention to the matters related to youth innovation, creation of opportunities, empowerment of women, natural disaster prevention and mitigation, and other important issues. Damas y caballeros, con todo el respeto y la seriedad con la cual siempre he tratado los temas que tengo a mi cargo, les pido su apoyo y la oportunidad de seguir sirviendo en esta organización como Secretario General Adjunto. Ustedes me conocen y conocen mi seriedad y vocación por servir a nuestros pueblos y nuestra gente, especialmente a los más vulnerables y necesitados de ayuda. I look forward to the opportunity of working with you, all of you, as we steer our beloved institution to new victories and a better future for our people, the people of the Americas. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mendez. I would like to remind delegations that each member state will have a maximum of two minutes to ask questions of the candidate. And for every five interventions by delegations, I will offer the floor to the candidate to answer for no more than five minutes. I would now like to offer the floor to delegations beginning with Antigua and Barbuda. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Having started this morning, I saw no good reason why you shouldn't start again this afternoon, so thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I address my remarks directly to Assistant Secretary General Mr. Mendez. The fact that uh, you, Mr. Mendez, are addressing us as an unopposed candidate demonstrates the trust and confidence in your service to member states over the last almost five years. I congratulate you on being responsible for this rare show of unanimity in this organization in recent time. You will, I suspect, be remembered for that. Now, in the context of your role as the elected, elected, not nominated, not appointed, but elected Assistant Secretary General uh, and the Secretary to the Permanent Council, I pose one question to you. And it is in the context of the relationship between the General Secretariat and the Permanent Council, which in the time, almost five years that I have been here, has not been the most harmonious relationship. And it is, I think everybody will agree, it is a relationship that needs much improvement. Now, having said that, I would like to know in what ways would you, as the elected Assistant Secretary General and as the Secretary to the Permanent Council, in what ways would you strengthen the work of the Permanent Council, including 
by filling the void that has existed for some time for the permanent council to have its own legal representative independent of the Secretariat? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mexico, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Eh, con base a que el secretario general adjunto debe asesorar al secretario general, ¿considera usted, basado en las lecciones aprendidas, que se requiere robustecer esa facultad, sobre todo en los temas prioritarios, ya que ese cargo es producto de una votación de los estados y en ese sentido cuenta con un objetivo respaldo político de la membresía? Thank you very much. Haiti, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, j'aimerais tout d'abord profiter de cette minute pour présenter mes félicitations à l'ambassadeur Nestor Mendes pour, que, pour que avoir posé sa candidature à sa propre élection. Et nous avons eu l'opportunité de travailler ensemble pendant les cinq dernières années. Mais maintenant, j'aimerais profiter, j'aimerais poser une question au secrétaire, au, au secrétaire général adjoint. Monsieur le secrétaire général adjoint, au cours de la cérémonie de votre installation en 2005, vous avez déclaré nous devons trouver des façons de surmonter nos défis et de créer un environnement propice à la prospérité économique et social en identifiant les nouveaux secteurs de coopération, en élaborant des mécanismes de financement créatif et en maximisant le potentiel catalytique de l'Organisation des États américains. Ceci étant dit, ma question est la suivante. Monsieur le secrétaire général adjoint, avez-vous réussi à mettre en place ces mécanismes de financement créatif. Sinon, quels sont les obstacles qui, qui vous ont empêché d'atteindre de tels objectifs? Merci. Thank you very much. Costa Rica, you have the floor. Gracias, señor presidente. Costa Rica, quisiera agradecer y felicitar al secretario general adjunto por su candidatura y la presentación del día de hoy. La legitimidad de esta organización depende, en muchos sentidos, en la posibilidad de ser relevante ante los retos cotidianos de las poblaciones de las Américas. Y en Centroamérica tenemos muchos retos, todos los países centroamericanos, desde los retos de seguridad, las migraciones, debilidades institucionales y, por supuesto, la desigualdad. Frente a estos retos, no deja de haber desesperanza en una población joven y sedienta de oportunidades. ¿Qué rol, entendiendo que eh, el secretario general es la cabeza política de la organización, qué rol puede jugar la OEA y su oficina en particular frente a esta población? Thank you very much. Ecuador, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Señor secretario general adjunto, felicitaciones por su presentación. Y un poco en línea con mi colega de Costa Rica, dentro del pilar del desarrollo integral, la OEA atribuye especial importancia al tema de la educación en el diseño de políticas que no solo garanticen, sino prioricen en ese sector. Usted se ha referido al programa, digamos, como puentes que mi país apoya. ¿Cuáles otras iniciativas directas, como usted acaba de mencionar, podría proponer usted en este campo? Porque la educación, convengamos, resulta esencial para asegurar la inclusión de nuestros jóvenes en el mercado de trabajo. ¿Cómo puede la OEA contribuir al desarrollo de una educación de calidad que permita en su debido momento que nuestras economías puedan tornarse más competitivas? Y ello con el concurso inclusive de las agencias asociadas que usted también mencionó. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Mendez, uh, you have five minutes to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I will try to respond to the questions in the order in which they were posited. Um, with regards to the Ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda and uh, how do we strengthen the work of the Permanent Council, 
and uh, go towards bridging those differences or, or that lack of communication between the General Secretariat and the Permanent Council. Actually, um, in the past, we have tried very hard from my office, which is the first point of contact between the Permanent Council and the General Secretariat, to actually do something about it. Uh, delegations may recall that um, for over the last years, I have uh, organized in my office these opportunities for informal exchanges, conversations, discussions on wide-ranging issues. Um, I think we need to do a lot more of that, um, both formally and informally. I also think that um, we need to work uh, closer with the, with, the, with the delegations to see if there are any particular issues around which they would want to organize these kinds of events, and my office can do it very easily. Uh, with regard to the assignment of a, of a dedicated legal counsel for the work of the Permanent Council, um, that is a function that if the member states uh, decide that it, it should be filled, that, that such a position should exist, that should be provided for in the budget. And once it is in the budget and it is justified, then we will have to act on it. Um, uh, if, if I understood what the Ambassador was saying is that uh, we may need uh, some, some specialized legal counsel beyond what is currently available internally. And if those are the parameters of that particular post, it, it can, can be designed in that way, in the same way that for the recruitment of certain specific posts within our organization, like the Director of Human Resources, there is a very specific criteria and process that is assigned to that selection. So if, that, if the member states feel that this is something that, that is absolutely essential, then of course, and if the decision is taken, then the Secretariat will have to implement it. Um, the question of Mexico, is there a need to strengthen that advisory role? Um, I believe there is always uh, an opportunity to strengthen that role, uh, particularly when there are difficult issues uh, to grapple with. Uh, but I also believe that um, it's not just a matter of strengthening that specific role, it's ensuring that there exists a cordial, professional, respectful relationship between the Office of the Secretary General and the Assistant Secretary General, which I understand has not always been the case uh, before. So we need to build on that. Um, if there is an additional dimension to what member states should be done by the Office of the Assistant Secretary General, then of course, uh, the, the prerogative, the, the legal capacity to, to head in this direction exists with member states. I really would, would like to see if, if it is possible if this role be not only enlarged but specified because once we get into certain positions or with certain responsibilities, things can get a little, a little murky. Um, with regards to the ability to, to find the new uh, opportunities for, for creative financing, not yet, although we have also been working very closely with the Young America's Business Trust. We've been doing a lot of political promotion of issues that have to do with youth, innovation, competitiveness, and the small business development centers, not only in the Caribbean, but in the other countries in Central America. Um, what role, what, what can the OS do for youth? And I will try to combine both the, the answers to both Costa Rica and Ecuador because I'm running out of time shortly. And so with youth as, as an institution, we have several programs already underway, some very, very good programs. Uh, for instance, the Young America's Business Trust runs the, the Competitiveness Fora. Uh, they run several um, exercises that are focused on the youth. We also have the Model OS, which is dedicated more to students, both at the, high, at the primary school, sorry, at the high school and the university levels but those could be expanded to capture a, a greater audience. Um, we also need to, to keep in mind that whatever focus, whatever resources we dedicate to the youth right now is an investment in the future and we cannot run away from that because those young people, young men and young girls who are 10 and 12 right now, if we don't dedicate the effort to provide them with the opportunities, with the education, with the social stability that they require, in 10 years' time, it's too late for them. So we need to focus on this now, and we need to dedicate more time and resources to these areas. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Panama, you have the floor. Gracias, Señor Presidente. Al agradecer la presentación que nos ha hecho atinadamente el Secretario General Adjunto, 
Quisiera también en línea con algunas previas, pero con otro enfoque, preguntar, como funcionario consultivo del secretario general y en el interés de asegurar una participación plural y balanceada con responsabilidades compartidas en el tratamiento de retos como inclusión, desarrollo, pobreza, entre otros, ¿qué recomendaciones tienen ese esfuerzo respecto a los distintos grupos regionales? Gracias. Thank you very much. Brazil, you have the floor. Obrigado, presidente. Boa tarde. Cumprimentos ao secretário-geral, secretário-geral adjunto e a todos os colegas. Na manhã de hoje, é, nós pudemos ouvir três plataformas de candidaturas, diferentes entre si, com, é, com enfoques, com matizes bastante notáveis entre uma e outra, é, e é, é útil para todos nós que o debate seja plural, como foi no dia de hoje. É, a candidata Maria Fernanda Espinosa é, falou, por exemplo, que ao tomar decisões por 18 votos, a organização se enfraquece. Ela chegou, inclusive, a desqualificar certas decisões que, em suas palavras, foram tomadas por o que ela chamou de maiorias pírricas. Em nossa opinião, contudo, na opinião do governo brasileiro, foi justamente com 18, 19 ou 20 votos que nos últimos 12 meses foram adotadas resoluções de grande contundência e efetividade que permitiram, por exemplo, proteger o povo venezuelano do, da ditadura brutal e perversa do regime de Nicolás Maduro. Precisamos ter muito cuidado, não convém que decisões tomadas por uma determinada maioria sejam deslegitimadas unicamente pela maioria que se forma em torno delas. Essa, essa, eu respondo, é a verdadeira essência da igualdade jurídica dos Estados, um voto para cada um de nós. E nós objetamos uma ideia de consenso que se construa em torno de um medíocre mínimo denominador comum. E eu pergunto ao, ao candidato Nestor Mendes, como vê a questão do consenso em nossos processos decisórios. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Venezuela, you have the floor. Gracias, presidente. Eh, quiero agradecerle al secretario general adjunto la presentación que acaba de hacernos, tanto en relación a lo, a lo que él ha venido desempeñando como en el en ejercicio del cargo como lo que presenta como un programa de gestión para los cinco años siguientes. Yo quería preguntarle al secretario general adjunto, en el mismo sentido que lo acaba de hacer el embajador de Brasil, ¿cuál es su visión sobre los mecanismos que tiene la OEA para generar consenso? Con, eh, hay como una especie de aspiración generalizada a que las decisiones no se vean polarizadas, a que no tengamos votaciones en las cuales los márgenes de decisión sean estrechos. Y de toda la mañana me quedó la duda en relación a qué mecanismos podrían seguirse para conseguir esos consensos amplios de que se está hablando. Y el secretario general adjunto, por las atribuciones que le confiere la Carta y por eh, la posición que ocupa como funcionario electo, en el caso suyo, es, una, es un caso especialmente interesante porque lo va a hacer por un consenso muy, muy amplio, al cual la delegación de Venezuela se suma. Eh, ¿Cómo enfoca usted la idea de la generación y creación de consenso? Es decir, el mecanismo de decisión establecido en cualquier organismo colegiado es el voto. Y en el voto, pues obviamente la mayoría prevalece sobre la minoría. Es la esencia de cualquier organización democrática. Y eh, la pregunta entonces muy concreta, señor secretario general, es qué mecanismo, secretario general asunto, perdón, qué mecanismos piensa usted que puedan implementarse para 
eh, esa formación de consenso más amplio. Thank you very much. Canada, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci euh, au secrétaire général adjoint pour sa présentation d'aujourd'hui, pour accepter de répondre à nos questions. Euh, je crois que votre présence aujourd'hui, votre, votre candidature euh, à cette réélection, euh, je, je pense, témoigne de votre engagement à la garde de notre, de notre organisation, et je vous en remercie sincèrement. Um, so I have two questions for the Assistant Secretary General. Um, And my first question will echo, I think, the question that was asked previously by my colleague from Mexico, which you've already answered, and I'll give you an, uh, maybe an opportunity to expand on, on your, your response from earlier. So how can the relationship between the Secretary General and the Assistant Secretary General be strengthened so as to better empower your office to play a more significant role within our organization? That would be my first question. My second question, um, Now, Canada strongly believes that the Office of the Assistant Secretary General has a great deal to contribute toward ensuring the sound stewardship and the management of the OAS as an organization. Now, what are the lessons that you've learned from your first mandate that you would, be, that you would build on if re-elected um, in order to strengthen management practices within the OAS? Thank you. Thank you very much. El Salvador, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Nuestras felicitaciones al eh, distinguido eh, secretario general adjunto, don Néstor Méndez. Estamos contentos eh, que usted esté tomando esta, este reto nuevamente. Eh, queríamos hacerle una pregunta, eh, y esa es, ¿cómo podría usted contribuir a coordinar de manera más eficaz la cooperación y trabajo conjunto SICA-CARICOM, tomando en cuenta que ya hay algunos mecanismos como un plan en materia de seguridad y temas de crucial interés común como cambio climático, desarrollo, educación, inclusión, entre otros. Y no puedo concluir sin congratularnos por lo bien que nuestra región ha estado representada por usted y su excelente gestión durante los, estos cinco años en su desempeño como secretario general adjunto. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Ambassador Mendez, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the ambassador of Panama asked about uh, what could be recommended to the sub-regional groups in terms of greater inclusion. Um, My office was very much instrumental. Actually, we took the leadership in working with the Permanent Council to finally create that window that deals with Afro-descendant issues and indigenous people's issues as an, as an institutional part of the OAS calendar. We did that a couple of years ago, uh, working with all the delegations. Um, this is giving uh, some, some, real, some real meat to those commitments that we have as an institution But because issues such as Afro-descendants and indigenous are so cross-sectional, they're so dispersed, there are few opportunities where they actually get the political coverage that they deserve. So we have taken the leadership in these issues. What can we do to, to advise an expansion of these efforts to the sub-regional groups? We, we already did, as a matter of fact. Um, I met with the Secretary General of SICA, Uh, not this September, the, the September before at the United Nations, and we shared with them precisely the plan of action that we had developed in my office to slowly start working with the Secretariat for Access to Rights and Equity to implement those parts of the convention that were doable, the low-hanging fruit in terms of the plans of action. So we're already working with them at the institutional level. Um, the Ambassador of Brazil uh, asking about consensus and the, the 18 vote majority. Ambassador, as the Secretary of the Permanent Council, a decision by the Permanent Council is a decision by the Permanent Council is a decision by the Permanent Council, whether or not it is by consensus or by a vote, an 18 majority or a super majority. As far as I'm concerned, once this body takes a decision, those are our marching instructions. Of course, of course, it would be optimum to be able to have consensus on more issues. 
And I think that we have to build that kind of environment eventually. It's not easy with the kind of very difficult issues that the Permanent Council has to grapple with. But my worry goes beyond that. Because the, the, the tension that, that sometimes prevails in the Permanent Council eventually contaminates other environments in the Secretariat where we did not see these kinds of tension before. So it is affecting others and we have to start to cure it from here. We need to have more instances for the representatives to get to know each other better, to have informal discussions. We may not be able to agree on everything, but we do not have to work in a hostile environment. And so my office is, is, is very well positioned to be able to do this, but we would have to do it hand in hand and with the goodwill of the, the, of the permanent council. Um, I think that partially uh, also answers what the ambassador of Venezuela was asking. How can we get to generate more consensus? We have to start to work it from here. The ambassador, the, the representative of Canada, um, asked about empowering the office of the Secretary General. Uh, sir, I would uh, like to remind the, the, uh, the, the Permanent Council that this is a matter that had been amply discussed in previous exercises on management, modernization, and in institutional strengthening. Um, there was also a discussion about uh, uh, retooling the office of the ASG as the Chief Operating Officer, thereby freeing the Secretary General to be the political head and, and establish the political direction for an institution as important as the OS. Um, unfortunately, that discussion did not reach its maturity, but if there is an opportunity for that to be retaken, I think it, it, it is a good thing to do. There are other some, some responsibilities that would be a natural extended fit for the Office of the Assistant Secretary General, and I'm just thinking out loud. For instance, as the Permanent Council, as the Secretary of the Permanent Council, we deal on a regular basis with the permanent observers. But the institutional link with them goes through another office. So in terms of streamlining, those are some of the things that we can talk about in terms of expanding the role, strengthening it, but also streamlining some of the functions internally. Um, how can we contribute from my office to strengthening SICA and uh, CARICOM relations based on the agenda? We're already doing this, Ambassador. Um, we, we have work. Uh, with SICA to renew, to update the memorandum of understanding we have between the OAS Secretariat and SICA. And right now we're in the process of doing exactly the same thing with the CARICOM Secretariat, which also needs to be updated. At the end of it, if you look at the, 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 the convergence of issues that have traditionally been pointed out by both CARICOM and SICA of being priority, they are very similar. The, the Caribbean and Central American regions have very similar objectives, very similar priorities, and very similar concerns. So to the extent that this can be put on the table, my office is very happy to work with both of these groups. As a matter of fact, they're both my families. Uh, we're, as a Belizean, I'm both CARICOM and SICA. So we would be more than happy to, to work with these two groups to see what we can do together using whatever resources we can bring from the institution. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. St. Lucia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Mr. Assistant Secretary General. There's been a lot of talk about transparency and efficiency in the OAS, notably to the candidate for Secretary General. The question for you, Mr. ASG, is how willing are you to review the strengths and weaknesses of your team or teams, considering the areas you cover? Have you already begun this process? I ask this very specifically as you've laid out an ambitious agenda you are responsible for quite a bit and you did make reference to the fact that you've been here for five years so you've had a chance to figure out what works or not thank you very much united states you have the floor thank you mr president first as the second to last speaker i want to commend you on an exceptional day on the way this entire forum has been run i think it's a testament to your leadership so thank you for that uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Mendez, uh, thank you for, for your candidacy and for being here today. We've heard a lot of discussion about consensus and the need to build consensus, but I think we also recognize that we're all bound by the pillars of the organization, mainly the respect for democracy and human rights, as also binds us in the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Over the course of the last years, we've seen a deteriorating situation in Venezuela and Nicaragua when it comes to human rights. and our inability to reach consensus on basic resolutions, mainly one which calls for the, the terrible human rights situation in Venezuela, 
which was drafted by the United Nations, by Michelle Bachelet, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and unfortunately was not adopted by consensus by this own body. To date, I think a lot of delegations, or not a lot, a few, have still not taken a position on the violation of human rights that are taking place in Venezuela, the 7,000 arbitrary deaths, detentions, and some governments continue to work with that illegitimate regime. Regarding Nicaragua, we've also seen the presentation by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, an organization from this own very body, present at the OAS on um, the violation of the religious freedoms, the violations of the civil society, the violations of all political actors, the tortures, deaths, and over 500 students who were killed in April of 2018, an area which consensus should be a simple uh, starting point for conversation, an area in which not all delegations have been able to announce. So as Secretary, Assistant Secretary General, I understand the informal conversation, but what else would you do to bring, I think, a baseline of consensus when pillars of this organization are violated, or should we abandon these pillars in order to achieve consensus? Regarding the finances, um, as you know, the United States funds over 60 percent of the general fund at this point, and a larger portion when it comes to voluntary funds. How would you work to encourage other member states to take on additional burdens, because it seems like people constantly push mandates, but to take on additional financial burdens in order to make sure the organization is sound? Thank you. Thank you very much. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Assistant Secretary General, for your presentation. In her presentation this morning, Maria Fernandez Pinoza made it clear that she would respect the decisions taken by both the Permanent Council and the General Assembly as the governing bodies of the organization. She also stated that she would foster dialogue and widen consensus. With a majority of 18, clearly there is a group of 16 member states whose interests are not met. What mechanisms, sir, apart from the meeting of regional coordinators, would you propose in order to widen consensus and serve the interests of all member states equally, irrespective of size or might? Thank you very much. Trinidad and Tobago, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, as did other delegations, I'd like to add my voice of appreciation to the Assistant Secretary General for his presentation. Um, Assistant Secretary General Mendez, in a different context, I posed a question concerning the critical principles or cohering principles that need to be upheld in the organization specifically at this moment, not with general reference to all of the principles in the Charter, which certainly are enduring and run throughout history until the Charter is amended. But from time to time, as did the current Secretary General, some principles rise to the top and require particular attention. The issue of consensus must now be addressed by this organization, both in terms of consensus as principle and consensus as process. It is apparent that consensus as process is now compromised within the framework of the OAS, and therefore relationships and the capacity to build and retain and enhance trust has not been well served. As the Assistant Secretary General, sitting as the Secretary of the Permanent Council, we are the day-to-day -day cut and thrust of the main executive body of this organization conducts its business. What do you see as the key principles now that need to be restored and upheld if we are to, in fact, achieve success at least? on consensus as a process that is inclusive of all member states. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Saunders, I regret that the rules, the 
Procedural guidelines do not allow me to offer delegations a second bite of the cherry. The agreement was that delegations would have a maximum of two minutes to pose questions to the candidates. And uh, I, I cannot offer you the floor, sir. Barbados, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for your leadership in this session. I'm from the session this morning. Uh, Ambassador Mendez, there is a perception that the OAS is not suited for development programming and that such initiatives are best left to the United Nations and other specialized agencies. What are your views on the appropriateness of the OAS as an agency for and an agent for development in the Americas? Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Mendez, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, the Ambassador of St. Lucia, about uh, my preparedness to review the strengths and weaknesses of my staff, absolutely. It's an ongoing process, and, and um, definitely whatever we can do in the new term, hopefully I, I will be successful in, in getting reelected. Uh, we have to look at it as a new term altogether. Um, yes, you are right that after five years, I have a pretty good idea of what works well and work, what needs to be tweaked or improved. And that is one of the reasons why in my presentation, I went to very specific practical things that we can actually do. Because um, after five years uh, inside the organization, I no longer have the luxury of claiming, well, I wasn't really sure. I think I have a pretty good idea what can be practically done in a very realistic way. Um, in terms of, of the getting to consensus, uh, how do we get to consensus with tough questions, uh, the first part of the, the U.S., that, that, is, that is a very tough question and it has been asked by several, several delegations. The truth is we may never be able to, to reach consensus on certain issues because of the nature of those issues. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, I have been working around the OS. Um, you know, at the risk of sounding, of dating myself, I, I would say easily for the last 20 years. And uh, the organization has evolved and the way members relate to each other and how things are eventually matured for the, for the, for the council to make a decision has certainly evolved. In the past, there was this uh, almost uh, informal obligation uh, that if, for example, a delegation wanted to propose a resolution or a declaration, that was shared amply from the very beginning. It wasn't until the last few years that I started noticing a pattern where some member states would get together in a small group and, and almost uh, agree on, on, on a document before it can be shared. I think if, if some of those basic, basic, very, very uh, simple but practical ways could be brought back with a level of, of commitment that, you know, there would be some political will to, to, to try to find consensus. Uh, but simple things like generating suspicion because people think that you're not putting everything on the table, I think those things don't contribute to, to building trust. If we could go back to those previous practices, perhaps those could serve to, 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 to straighten or, or to improve the environment here. With regards to how do we get more member states how do we convince them to assume a greater burden in the, maintain, the financial maintenance of the institution? One of the, the, the new products I, I spoke about, the, the information product for the Permanent Council, seeks to do specifically this. Because what we, we, what we noticed, we did an exercise in my office um, about, about two years ago, where we went through every member state and we looked and, and we detailed specifically what the OS was doing in each one of them. And then we quantified what was the tangible value for those that could be quantified. And then we had a separate listing for the intangibles. I mean, if you know there is a project on training security personnel, you know how much you're investing in it. But if you have received an, an election observation mission, how do you assign a value to the maintenance of your democracy? So there are certain intangibles that cannot be quantified. But what we realized was that when we detailed everything that we were doing in each of the countries, invariably, invariably, without exception, everybody gets more back from the organization than you're putting back in in terms of street quotas, invariably. And it doesn't have to be in direct, direct what you get from, from the activities invested. 
Um, we could take any country and look over it, and we can see the benefits that come to it. I think that looking at what this tool will show to the countries, what are the benefits you get from this institution, is a very practical way of saying, hey, maybe it's time that you consider sharing some more of the burden. That's just a very practical, very practical approach to take. Um, what mechanisms would go further in, in generating that consensus? I think going back to those practices of circulating whatever was proposed, being proposed before, generating again those instances for greater dialogue. If people don't know each other, they cannot communicate well. And until we start building those additional instances, then we won't have those places where people can have wider discussions than, except than only on, on things that are conflictive. The key principles of consensus building, what are some of the things that would have to be uh, restored? Ambassador, I'll tell you some of the things that I, I believe we have to always keep in mind and where necessary, go back to it. Some old principles like fair play, a rules-based environment where everybody is measured with the same yardstick, where everybody knows what, what belongs to you or what you're entitled to, and you don't hope to go beyond that just because you are who you are. I think those basic principles, transparency, clarity, and above all, if we cannot agree on something, let us be upfront about it, you know. It doesn't mean we cannot agree on anything. Those things on which we cannot agree, okay, we understand why. But those things in which we can agree for the greater good, we really should make an effort. Um, in terms of uh, the question by the ambassador of, of, of Barbados, uh, the perception that the OS is not suited uh, for development, I don't agree with that perception. Because depending on what member state you ask or what sub-region of the organization you ask, the, the assigned priority the, with which they perceive the OS is different. So for some countries, for some of the, 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 the smaller states, clearly the OS is still an important development partner. Clearly the OS has a role to play in certain niches that will not be filled by the United Nations, that will not be filled by the IDB, because to start with, not of our members, all of the OS members are members of the IDB. There is an important component of small Caribbean countries that are not members of the IDB. And to think that the IDB will put money in there, I don't know how, how realistic that is. But there is a niche, there are important gaps that the OAS is filling right now. And I think that to the extent that we decrease those services we bring, that we stop fulfilling those needs in the member states, our value as an institution before those member states decreases, and we do not want that to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. You will note that I was uncharacteristically generous with my time at the end, given that there were no other requests to the floor and no other candidates to present. But thank you very much. Uh, I see no other requests to the floor. I will therefore ask Ambassador Mendes to give his closing remarks of five minutes. Ambassador Mendes, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, since you were very generous with me uh, in answering the questions, I will not use all of, all of the five minutes. Um, some of the things that, that I have experienced in the last five years within the organization um, have been quite, quite illustrative. They have taught me a great deal of things. Um, as much as what things should be done as things that should not be done. Um, so I am hoping that with the experience that I have acquired working with this fantastic institution, working with some of the consummate diplomats from all 34 member states, hopefully the next five years will be one where we can move ahead on those pressing things, that the, the commitments that we have with our member states. I really do think that, you know, in working in a very deliberate way to improve the ambience, the environment, the working conditions in the Permanent Council uh, can help us move beyond some of those more difficult uh, conditions. I also think that providing the information that we're proposing to provide to the member states, including the new video minutes that we will be, uh, we will be rolling out uh, in the not too distant future, the verbatim minutes up to date of the Permanent Council, uh, the provision of that snapshot every month or every two months so that everybody knows what we're doing in their countries. Those things will go to alleviate some of the issues that come up before us simply because of lack of information. Um, I'm asking for your support. Um, I'm asking for your cooperation. There is a lot that needs to be done in this organization. And the Secretariat cannot do it alone. 
the OS is not the General Secretary, the OS is not the Permanent Council alone. All of us make the OS, all of us have a stake in this institution, and I know that if all of us work together, certainly our institution can live up to the demands and needs of what the people of the Americas expect and deserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Mendez, on behalf of the Permanent Council, I would like to thank you for your presentation today. Indeed, I would like to thank all the candidates who have been here today, Secretary General Almagro, Ambassador Hugo de Sela, Ambassador Maria Fernanda Espinosa. I think that the organization can only be enriched by the discussions we've had today, and I wish each candidate good luck in the elections to come. Distinguished representatives, I thank you for your cooperation, and thank you for your attention. This meeting is adjourned.